Does uh, risk taking run in your family? It does now. <laughs> Six years ago, uh, your daughter had had ALL, the commonest childhood cancer. Yeah. Uh, it's a cancer which many children uh, are cured from, 85%. Yeah, we were told in the beginning that it's the garden variety kind of cancer, and if your child had to have cancer, this is the one you wanted to have. And how did you feel when you found that you were in the 15%? Well, I've, I've, I've said many, very often that when she relapsed, it was much harder than the, the initial diagnosis. And, um, you know, we were told that day that there was a less than 30% chance of survival. And, and our goal at that point was to go to a bone marrow transplant. We tried to do that, uh, but before we started that, you know, down that path, we went to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to get another opinion. And uh, now we're, we're very happy we did that. At that time, they said, go ahead and go to bone marrow transplant, and we tried to do that. And their goal was to go uh, early February of 2012. And then our donor actually uh, delayed us. The donor wasn't available till the last week of February of 2012. And Emily relapsed about mid-February. So we, uh, we went down for another opinion at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and then Finally, one day, our, our doctor at our local hospital said, There's, we have no more weapons to fight Emily's cancer. And uh, they wanted us to go home on hospice, and I, and I paged uh, the doctors down at CHOP and said, we're coming no matter what. And they said the CAR-T trial opened yesterday when I called. Bruce, when did you, uh, when did you first meet this family? So the, Emily was the uh, first patient, the very first, on uh, this CAR-T trial in kids. Uh, and I had a practice of trying to go down and meet patients, especially uh, the first patients on trials. And uh, the uh, dose was divided into three fractions, where the patients would get 10% on the first day, 30% on the second, and 60% on the third day. And I wasn't able to make it on the very first day, but on the second day, which I believe was April 12th or, or thereabouts. April uh, 17th, 18th, and yeah. 19th. <laughs> so Tom has it down. Yeah. And uh, I walked into the room, and, and uh, Emily was in the bed, just as you saw, having a, a green popsicle. Uh, and, and that's because the cells are cryopreserved in DMSO, has, has a garlicky taste. And, and I met uh, Tom and Carrie, and, and they welcomed me into the room. And, and I'm thinking, here they are. Their child has relapsed with leukemia. They asked me to sit on the bed next to Emily and take a picture. Uh, and um, uh, I can't describe how it felt as a PhD, seeing the work uh, that I had been working on for so many years. And, being used to treat a child. It was uh, one of the most uh, moving moments um, I had in my career up until uh, that point. Another is on the screen behind you. Uh, and um, what that is, and, and Tom can tell from his perspective, but what you see behind you is a picture of the FDA Oncology Drug Advisory Committee meeting, uh, July, mid-July of um, 2017, um, and to hear Novartis uh, give their presentation, uh, Steve Grupp at CHOP, who you saw in the movie, give his presentation, and then the patient advocates begin to speak. Uh, it gave me chills up and down all day, uh, and you see Tom uh, testifying to the committee and right in the middle of his testimony, Emily came up to stand next to him. I'm in the chair on the edge, and Carl June is directly to my right. And then the committee uh, voted unanimously to approve. And uh, I'll let Tom tell from his perspective that day. Yeah, so I had been uh, messaging Novartis and, and Penn and Bruce and, and Dr. Grupp ever since Emily got better. Um, because of so many families that had reached out to us when Emily got better saying, we need this treatment too. And I said, you know, I want to be a part of getting this FDA approval so more children can get treated and hopefully, you know, it'll get passed around the world. Um, but that day when we went, uh, we took Emily. She was the only child at the meeting. And I said to her before I went in, I said, Emily, if you walk up and the panel can see you, that's more important than any words that I can say. 
And she said, it's too stressful in here. I don't think I want to come up there. And I said, okay, and I'll just call you out at some point and maybe you can raise your hand so they can see that you're here. And then I got halfway through my prepared statement and um, you know, they had told me if you run long, the mic goes dead, so make sure you get your message out there. And uh, I was pretty nervous myself having that time constraint. And I got halfway through and Emily walked up on her own and touched my arm. And then, uh, then I started crying. And, and of course, that's what made it onto the national news that night. <laughs> So, so um, in, in 1999, I, I like digging back in people's resumes, and in 1999, you were a founding director of the, uh, the clinical cell and vaccine production facility. Mm -hmm. And you, you know me, you know the word I like the most in, in that title is production. You have to be able to make these things. Um, <clears throat> So then in 1999, I don't know what you were doing in 1999, but in 1999, then to uh, six years ago, to 2012, when Emily was treated, um, did you have any idea what, was, what you were getting into? Did you, did you think we'd be having this discussion here today, six years later, or no, well, 20 years later? I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, we had done many clinical trials to that point uh, when um, we opened the CAR T-cell trial for adults in 2010 and, and kids in 2012. Uh, and there are things you draw up on the, right, on the whiteboard in your office, like things you wish would happen, but or, or it's never going to happen. Uh, and uh, Tom and Carrie came to visit in my, uh, me in my office a few months after Emily was treated, and I had the flow cytometry plots of her leukemia disappearing in 23 days and the CAR T cells exploding uh, and dividing to kill the leukemia. I had that up like, like you have your refrigerator at home. That was on my file cabinet in my office because I could not believe how perfect those results were with what you wish would happen. Uh, and it's just an incredible uh, story. And, and I will say also that I think there is no family that has done more for the approval of a drug um, than the Whiteheads have done for Camraya. Their advocacy uh, serving as an example, uh, the uh, risk of uh, being the first patient to enroll and everything uh, that they've done since then. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. So. Thank you. I. I think we all uh, heartily agree with that, and uh, we look to you for your guidance based on your experience. Um, what, what can you tell patient advocates, what can you tell cl clinical development specialists, uh, what, what, not, not in any way being critical of the, the, the clinical development of Kim Raya, uh, but what have you learned and what would you prefer to see more of or less of uh, in the future in the development of these drugs? Because there are a hell of a lot of these drugs being developed now. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, educating the oncologists, we'd like to see more of as parents. Um, you know, our local oncologist said we were basically wasting our time going to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And, and I still get messages from families from all over the world with their local oncologists telling them, you know, this isn't the way to go. Some are even suggesting hospice is a better option. So, you know, from, from our end, um, we're out there trying to continually tell Emily's story and spread the word to help get more approvals. We have a lot of international patients that can't get the treatment yet, um, or they're told, you know, you have to raise $500,000 to come to the United States to get treated um, because their national health care won't pay for it. Um, but, um, I tell people that are working on it, just keep doing what you're doing. If everyone didn't do their job, you know, the way they did it to get Emily's treatment ready. I mean, we were told on more than one occasion that Emily was 48 hours away from kidney failure. So, I mean, as far as what we would like to see is, and our goal every day is for this, these treatments to become accessible for the patients that need them. Bruce, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of based on the, the Kimraya development experience? Uh, 
Well, some of uh, that you alluded to in the opening, uh, and uh, that's already begun to happen. Um, back in the early days, and, and uh, actually started the facility at the Navy in 1994, but back then in the uh, late, mid to late 90s, early 2000s, we didn't have the equipment and tools and reagents and software platforms that are available today. Uh, and there has to be continuing evolution so that we can not only uh, make better what we have, not only in leukemia and lymphoma, but also in solid tumors, but to have it accessible to be able to treat more patients. So uh, what I like to see more of is what we're doing at this meeting this week, but also going back to develop those new technologies so that we as uh, scientists and clinicians can bring those technologies to clinic. Tools and technology is not the most glamorous end of the field. No, but that's the work that needs to be done to be able to get these therapies to the clinic. Uh, now, that's uh, been my background, and, and Tom brings his perspective as the patient, and that's really brought home to me the other side of the coin, right? Who are you doing the research for? Uh, and uh, when we opened up our new facility in 2016 at Penn um, for manufacturing uh, cells. I had in mind that we want to remind the people working in that facility every day why they're there. So we have patient pictures up in the hallways. We have about eight Emily pictures. Uh, we have pictures of other patients as well. So we want that reminder why those people are working long hours, why they're coming in on the weekend. And, and it's a real treat and a privilege when we have patients and families visit and they get to meet the people that grew their cells and did the testing on their cells. Tom, do you talk to other patients about the price of these drugs? Yeah, quite often. Uh, some, of the, some of the parents you know, have been applauding our efforts to get overseas and, and make visits because, and the media also reaches out to us from other countries saying if, if you have a presence here, it's more likely that our government will, uh, will pay for it. But that's a huge uh, question of, of, you know, getting it covered and then, you know, having health care that will cover the cost of the treatment afterward. Um, so, yes, we have a private Facebook group where just the parents of CAR-T kids can come on there. So if the next set of parents is going into whatever trial at any, at any center, uh, we'll add them and they can ask questions about whatever reaction their child is having, you know, from experienced parents that have been there. And, and on there, the, the price is actually considered by parents sometimes before they go pick a trial, or, and the accessibility of uh, can we get the cells. And let's just be clear, we're not just talking about the price of the drug. We're talking about the price of the associated care, taking care of side effects, right. which can also be quite significant, I think that's, as you know. That's usually a bigger question, I believe. I, um, you know, I talk to people when you, when you see the, the price of Kim Raya and you see that in, in the news and people are saying it's too expensive. And uh, you know, I tell them our, our Blue Cross, not, not all of Emily's cancer care in 2012, our Blue Cross was billed over $3 million. So to think now that a patient can get it uh, for $450,000 and um, you know a majority of those patients are done with their cancer care it's amazing for the patients and then you go home and you worry about if the government passes lifetime caps on your health care or pre-existing conditions then that would you know our family couldn't make it if that ever happened and uh, your family would be would have that situation in common with many many other families Correct. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for, for your contribution tonight, and I think you'll enjoy our next speaker, who we're very lucky is going to be able to explain how we are going to be able to afford all of these things, uh, which you've fought so, uh, fought so hard for, both of you. So thank you once again. Thanks for having us.